please have your Bibles open to that passage in Luke and chapter 1. I wonder, what do you think Christmas is all about? What do you think of its place or what its place is in our culture? How do most people in our communities or in our families view the meaning of Christmas? Well, a poll a few years ago found that 91% of uh, people in Great Britain celebrate Christmas. But only about 20% of them say that they are celebrating the birth of Jesus. Christmas has basically become a secular festival in our land. Most people say that the holiday is mainly about spending quality time with family. It's mainly about being generous with our gift giving. It's mainly about enjoying good food and drink. It's mainly about appreciating uh, beauty of lights and decorations. In fact, more people say that the most important thing about the holiday, the most important thing about Christmas for them, more people say that the most important thing is watching Christmas films. That's what most people say, rather than about celebrating Jesus' birth. Well, the leader of the British uh, Humanist Association, those who do not believe in God, believe that humanity is the center of all things, The leader of the British Humanist Association, he summed it up well. He said, for an overwhelming majority of people in Britain, this time of year has nothing at all to do with religion. And it has everything to do with celebrating the life we have with the people we love. Sadly, he is right. Most people in this country do not give a thought for the most significant birthday in the history of the world. And even worse, many Christians have only a, a shallow, kind of sentimental view of a baby quietly sleeping in a manger, of shepherds and wise men in attendance, of farm animals gently looking on. Now, some of us, of course, are going to have different views on Christmas as a national holiday, whether it has any uh, legitimate historic connection to the birth of Jesus. I hate to spoil it for you, but Jesus almost certainly was not born in December. It was more likely in the spring or the summer or the autumn when the shepherds were out in their fields. At this time of year, they would have their sheep in their houses. As most historians will tell you, Christmas was merely appropriated from an already existing pagan festival. And it was Christianized to make what we today celebrate as Christmas. It may be true. It might not be true. People argue about that. But if it is true, in a sense, Christmas has come full circle, hasn't it? It began as a pagan holiday and it is now turning back into one or it already is one. So what is the true meaning of Christmas? What exactly are we celebrating? Should we be enjoying all of the things that people enjoy about Christmas, but also be looking beyond them to the deeper significance of what God did in history 2,000 years ago? Well, our passage this morning in Luke chapter 1 has the potential to cut through All the distractions, all the stress of Christmas and of the month of December. It has the potential to fan the flames of our faith. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56 is often called the visitation. The visitation. After hearing the amazing announcement from the angel Gabriel, we looked at that last week, Mary leaves her home in the north. And the angel told her that she was going to conceive in her virgin body a child, the child. Every generation since Adam and Eve have been waiting for this child to come. The very first promise that God made to his creatures after they rebelled against him was that he would send someone to turn everything upside down and reverse the curse. 
But we find out that he's going to do it in the most unexpected way. The divine king will be born to nobodies from nowhere. In total obscurity, in total anonymity. And yet, at the same time, as the angel Gabriel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 32, he, that is Jesus, he will be great. And he will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Well, in our passage this morning, Mary herself opens a window for us onto this great king and his never-ending kingdom. Far from being inconsequential, like the leader of the British Humanist Society would have us believe, or merely sentimental, like many Christians believe, the coming of Jesus into the world is an event like no other. It is an event of the greatest significance. It turns the page of history. Jesus is going to flip everything on its head so that nothing will ever be the same again. So this morning, we're going to spend a few minutes considering the good news of what God did in and through the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago, connected to what God is still doing today and what God will do in the future. So let's hear the good news from this passage about what God does. What he does. This is where everything gets turned upside down. God does two things, according to this passage, two things in the coming of his son. Firstly, Christmas is all about The judgment of God. It's a bit surprising. Bear with me. This is not usually the first thing that comes to mind when we think of Christmas, is it? But Christmas is all about Jesus invading history to turn everything upside down. In this case, he's going to uproot and he's going to overturn evil itself. Of course, from our vantage point, it's been 2,000 years since the first Christmas. And when we look around our world, it looks as though God's enemies still have the upper hand. It doesn't seem like Christmas had all that much of an impact on sin and injustice. God's enemies are still getting away with their crimes. But this passage shows us that Christmas is the guarantee that evildoers who do not turn from their evil ways will be judged. They will be judged. Mary here confidently sings of God's coming justice. In fact, she's so confident of what she sings. She's so confident that she speaks about what God does in the past tense. Of what God will do in the past tense. This is why it's confusing for us. She speaks as if God has already accomplished this great judgment. This happens all the time in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament prophets. It's as though when considering the things that God is going to do in the future, the prophet is so sure that in his or her mind, it is as good as done. So with the arrival of Jesus, judgment begins. The final era of history has dawned. It will be a time when God, verse 51, scatters the proud. Verse 52, it's a time when God topples the mighty from their thrones. It's a time, verse 53, when God sends the rich away empty. This is the upside down kingdom where all our human expectations are turned on their head. We expect the proud and the strong and and the rich to continue to be in control of human affairs. And Mary sings about what God will do in and through her son. But again, this was 2,000 years ago, wasn't it? There is currently a despot in Moscow hurling death and destruction at one of his neighbors. In fact, if you were to type into Google the number of current wars, you would very quickly despair. It's tragic. You would become disheartened. You'd find it very hard to put God's future promises into the past tense. And Mary, 
She was born into a world far worse than ours. It was a world of subjugation of weaker countries like like her nation of Israel by powerful empires like Rome. She lived in a brutal world where men and women were nailed to pieces of wood to suffer and slowly die. She would have seen bodies rotting on crucifixes lining the roads near her home. She maybe even saw them on her way to visit Elizabeth. So no doubt she felt the tension, perhaps more keenly than we do. And yet, she doesn't despair. She knows that judgment is what will come to pass in the end. But in case we're only thinking of things far from home, like distant wars, proud leaders in other parts of the world, all their power and their wealth that they rely on, let's narrow the focus of God's judgment on our own hearts for a moment. You see, this passage confronts each one of us. Search your heart and answer these questions honestly. Are you someone who has at the center of things in your mind your own self? Are you at the center of things in your own mind? Are you someone who relies on your own strength when faced with challenges? Are you someone who pursues wealth and material possessions at the expense of other things? You see, these words of judgment can be applied to any one of us in this room, if we're honest. The heart of all sin is pride. Adam and Eve gave in to the temptation to be like God, and we have all followed in their footsteps. When we sin, we envision ourselves sitting on God's throne, making up the rules that we want to live by, rules that we even expect others to live by. Pride is all about putting yourself first, shrinking the size of the world right down to the size of your life, being consumed with your own wants, with your own desires, and pursuing them above all other things. After we've created our own moral code to live by, we then think we have the strength, we have the power to live according to it. We, in effect, seek to save ourselves, don't we? Relying on our own power. And, of course, our power often turns outward, seeking to dominate others, to bring them into conformity with our desires. And then there's the pursuit of wealth. This should be very obvious to all of us living like royalty in the 21st century. Compared to Mary, we are wealthier than the Roman emperor who ruled over her. Did you know that? You are more wealthy than the Roman emperor at the time of Mary. You live longer. You're healthier. You're safer. You may have more in your bank account or in the value of your house. I wonder, though, are you a person who pursues wealth and finds satisfaction when you have the things that you want, the material possessions that you think will bring you happiness? Now, this is perfectly clear when we are talking about evil world leaders, but we need to have God's word become like a mirror on our own hearts and our own lives this morning. We will deceive ourselves if we think this is, if we think this is just talking about other people. If we are those who depend on our wealth, or our strength, or our self-importance, then the end of this road is only judgment. Being scattered, being toppled, being emptied of our riches. There's no middle ground here. We either depend on ourselves, or we depend on God to save us. Two options. But why is this judgment, why is this judgment part of the good news of Christmas? It's because judgment and salvation are two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. When God judges the enemies of his people, then his people are then free from tyranny and temptation. When God judges his own people's pride 
and their sole pursuit of power and possessions, God the Father then pours out his judgment on Jesus in their place. God is righteous. He upholds his will at all times. He never sweeps sin under the rug. Ever. And so Jesus bears it in the place of his people. Justice must be done. It must be done. And Jesus must take it if his people are going to be free from its consequences. You see, the judgment of Calvary was only possible because of Christmas. So it's good news that God's judgment has begun and will one day be completed. But that is only one side of the good news coin. Yes, it's good news that judgment has begun, but it's also good news that salvation has come. So secondly, Christmas is all about the salvation that God brings. Mary experienced God, God's grace at a personal level. See what she says in verse 48. He has looked with favor. Verse 49, he has done great things for me. How many of us could recount the manifold mercies of God in our lives? But Mary doesn't stop there. Her vision expands to include not just herself and her own generation, but verse 48, all generations. Verse 50, from generation to generation. You see, the page of history has turned. From now on, everything will be different. God's grace will come through the child in her womb, out to the farthest corners of the world and to the end of time. Jesus' salvation will invade every nook and cranny of his creation. This little scene in Luke chapter 1, like I said, is called the visitation. I love that name. It begins in verse 39. In those days, Mary set out, hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. And the scene ends in verse 56. And Mary stayed with her about three months, and then she returned to her home. There and back again. But Mary's visitation reflects a greater visitation, doesn't it? You see, Jesus himself set out on a journey from heaven to earth, hurrying from his father's house to come and greet us with his grace. He stayed with us not just for three months, but for three decades. And he visited us with salvation through his teaching, through his miracles, through his creation of a people, through his sacrificial death through his life-giving resurrection, his ascension to the throne of heaven, his pouring out of his spirit upon his people. He came to save. His name describes who he is. But he will visit again in the future. And when he comes back, he will visit his creation in final judgment. So that the proud will be brought low, the strong will be made weak, the rich will be emptied of their wealth. And that day, everything will be turned upside down. And so that means that now is the time to respond positively to Jesus. His upside down kingdom has invaded this world. So don't wait until it's too late. So what does it look like for us to respond appropriately? Well, three responses from this scene. Firstly, the appropriate response to the gospel is faith. Can you imagine how much Gabriel's words to Mary tested her faith? And yet, verse 45, Mary believed that the Lord would fulfill what he had spoken to her. You see, her faith was in God's faithfulness. He was going to keep his word to her, just as he kept his word to her people, verse 54. In the coming of Jesus, God was remembering his mercy to Abraham and to his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. God was keeping his ancient promises, and he calls his people in every generation, including ours, to trust him. 
to trust his word. Believe in this good news, this faithfulness of God to come and judge and save. After all, this is the very reason that Luke wrote his gospel, isn't it? In the opening verses, Luke tells us that he wrote it so that we would have certainty. Very important word. That we would have certainty that these things really happened. So I think there's two things from this chapter uh, that will fan the flames of our faith if we put them into practice. Firstly, there's an implication of what's going on here. Firstly, read the things written down for us to have certainty in. Seems obvious, doesn't it? The Bible is the grand story of salvation from Genesis to Revelation. So I would encourage you and myself to pray. To pray that God would give us the desire to read his word and to reflect on it. And then to actually go and take the time to read it. Such an important thing for us to do. When you do, take special note of God's very great and precious promises. They're all over the place. Hold on to them in your heart. So read the things written down for us to have certainty in. And then secondly, another implication from this passage, Mary goes and visits Elizabeth. So secondly, encourage one another with these promises. Tell each other of the great things that God has done in your lives. Notice that God sent Mary to Elizabeth. Why is that? Why did he do it? It was so that she could be encouraged in her faith by Elizabeth and that Elizabeth would be encouraged in her faith by Mary. For you, maybe this looks like getting together with another Christian and reading a couple of chapters of God's words and talking about them, praying about them, talking about your life. As you read God's word individually, as you speak about these things that you read with another Christian, you both will be encouraged in your faith and it will grow your personal trust in Jesus. So those are two kind of implications that we can take away. It's two applications of the first point, which is the appropriate response to the gospel is faith. So read the Bible. Ask God to give you the desire and share these things with other people. Secondly, the appropriate response to the gospel is humility. This is beautifully displayed in this passage. Notice uh, Elizabeth's humility here. She is a barren woman who lived a life of sadness because of her infertility, shamed by other people. This greatest moment in her life when God gave her a child is something that she would no doubt be so proud of and want to talk about. Yet when Mary shows up in her house, what happens? All attention is on Mary and on Jesus. Elizabeth, like her son John the Baptist, would one day know she knew that she must decrease and Jesus must increase. She doesn't put the spotlight on herself. She honors her cousin. She praises God for what he was doing in her life. This is true humility, isn't it? Take the spotlight off yourself and put it on Jesus. Mary is also humbled by God's honoring her. She, verse 46, magnifies the Lord. She sees herself in light of God's unsearchable greatness and glory. The illustration of the telescope and the microscope has stuck with me, so I'll share it with you. There are two ways that you can magnify something. Uh, firstly, you can magnify something very small with a microscope, something like a snowflake. And you can make it appear larger than it really is. Or you can magnify something with a telescope, something like a star or a planet. Something that to the naked eye is quite small, but in reality is massive. And when you use that telescope to magnify it, it makes it seem more like what it really is. 
Now, which kind of magnifying do we do with God? But for many people, God is a small thing that we make appear larger in our minds and our hearts. But in reality, God is infinitely great and glorious. And our magnifying is to bring our minds and our hearts in alignment with that reality. When we do this, when we consider his greatness, it will humble us. We have no other choice than to be humbled when we consider the greatness of God. We are made to feel small and insignificant in comparison with him. But this is the wonder of grace, isn't it? When we humble ourselves before him, he then lifts us up and makes much of us. He includes us in his grand plans for his kingdom and his glory. We are brought up out of our little kingdom of one, and we are given a place in his glorious kingdom. And it is this very thing that leads us to our third application. When we firstly have faith in God's faithfulness, and we are secondly humbled by his greatness, humbled by his grace towards us, then thirdly, the appropriate response to the gospel is joy. Verse 47, Mary sings, My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The good news of salvation brings joy to the hearts of God's people. But Mary isn't the only joyful one, is she? Elizabeth, verse 41, is filled with the Holy Spirit, full of joy at Mary's visit. But the joy still doesn't end there, does it? Even verse 44, little John leaps for joy inside of her. And remember what the angels promised to John's father, Zechariah, was in verse 15? That John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. We're supposed to see that there is a relationship between joy and the Holy Spirit. This Christmas season, may God and his Spirit help you to recognize and to trust Jesus. To have faith in God's faithfulness. He will keep his promises. May God's spirit humble you as you see yourself in light of his greatness and his glory. And may God's spirit fill you with rejoicing when you consider his gracious plans for you. Let's pray together.